If you have your Bible, meet me in Luke, the fifth chapter. We're not going to do a whole lot of jumping around. Some of you guys are with farms and cows. We're going to milk this passage. I don't know if this is how you milk a cow or not, but this is what I think it looks like. We're going we're gonna to milk it tonight, and we're going to see what God has to say to us out of Luke chapter 5, starting at verse 1 through 11. I'm so excited because discipleship is the place we need to be. There's no secret that the church of America is dwindling by the second. Much of that dwindling has to do with a lack of three things. The first one is a lack of prayer. If you do not pray, how can God ever move? So what we're dealing with is a bunch of cleaned up flesh and no power of God. Paul said, I didn't come to you with eloquent words. Paul knew multiple languages. He says, what I need for you to have is a demonstration of the Spirit's power. Power comes through prayer. So where there's no prayer, there's no power. So one reason we're diminishing is lack of prayer. The second one is just as big. The Bible says love never fails, and we don't believe in love. How do I know that? Because the Bible says love keeps track of no wrongdoings, and we always say stuff like, you did that. Do it one more time. Right? Right? So we don't have this God kind of love. We got this L-U-V love that if you play with me, I get back at you, love. But that's why the church ain't multiplying. Because he says you got to deny yourself. Pick up your cross and follow me. We're not picking up no cross because we ain't laying down for nobody. So we can't make disciples as long as we want to be better than Jesus. Love is to lay down your life. So that's number two. Number three is disciples. If we're only hoarding the word of God and we're not producing, reproducing followers of Christ, then no one gets the opportunity to experience a multiplying, everlasting word of God. Until we embody at least those three principles all found in Scripture, we'll find ourselves continuing to shrink back. But I believe God raised up a remnant tonight who refuses to shrink back. I think that's what the first man said tonight, that we will reject passivity and we will submit to God's word and we will forcefully advance the kingdom of God. Because that's what men do. And if anybody's here for that tonight, you can say amen. Amen. Have we arrived at Luke chapter 5? Yes? Let's get it up on a slide PowerPoint if we can. And let's all join together at verse 1. Y'all can fill in some blanks for me. That'll help me keep y'all awake a little while longer. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him. I love this demonstration. Come here, my two young men, real quick. Y'all young. Come on, quick, quick, quick. Red shirt. Come on. Act like you didn't just eat steak. Hustle, hustle, hustle. So that's that passage. Come on, y'all. Y'all act like y'all play baseball, right? First and third base. All right. So... This passage is easy to miss. I love those little words in scriptures. We just act like they don't matter. But that word pressing is not our understanding of pressing. That word in the Greek means the crowd was crushing him. Come on, y'all crush, 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 crush. All right, all right. This little one's uh, stronger. Um, The crowd's pressing in on him. But you know what I love? I love why they were pressing. Y'all almost missed it. Why were they pressing, man? What does that say? Can you read that? No, can you read that? Okay, turn around. (laughs) Why were they pressing on him to do what? To hear the word of God. When was the last time? that you looked at your life and said, rather than leaning on something that's created to soothe my tensions, I'm going to press in to get what I need. I'm not going to settle for nursing my flesh, but rather than nursing the thing that's killing me, I'm going to press into the one that can fill me. That's where these people were. To make a disciple, it starts with a hunger. It starts with a thirst. It starts with a willingness to press in no matter who's looking at you. Do you realize we pursue God less depending on who's around? 
Do y'all notice that? Like, like in this men's conference, hey, man, like y'all see y'all, 10,000 years. Like, man, we sing it, right? But depending on who's watching us, that determines how hard we press. God says, will you press no matter who's looking? Will you press no matter who's watching? Will you want to hear no matter who's with you? Because that's when you can receive a God who loves you. Y'all know what our wives would do if we turned on them if somebody else was around? Get ready to sign a divorce contract. Can't experience God until you press. And when you determine that somebody's opinion matters more to you than the word of God, we're already starting at a deficit. And if you buy somebody's opinion of you, you just bought their lifestyle. Press. Nothing about this is easy. Let me start there. Yeah, this is no candy crush gospel. This is not rose petals. The brother we love had a thorn put on his head with thorns this big. That's your savior. You got to press. You got to push. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. People who die in order that they may live. That's the gospel. Amen? Amen. So it starts with pressing in on him to hear the word of God. Now, Jesus was doing something. He was standing. They were pressing. He was standing. They were crushing him. Crush again, man. He's not crushing. They were crushing. But he's what? He's standing. Can I tell you all a quick story? Give my young volunteers a hand. Y'all did good. Y'all did good. Y'all wake up. Raise your hand if you're anything like me. I had to travel six hours on the road just now. And you know what I can't stand more than anything in life? I'm going to confess in front of about 80 men. I can't stand pit stops. Raise your hand if you can testify. All right. I got about five, eight people, to be honest, tonight. Let me tell you, say it again, Frank. He had an age, he got to have him. There's a release in Frank. Man, I just, there's just something about him. Like, I'm the type of person that brags when I don't use the restroom. I made it with no stops. Right? But boy, a couple of years ago, God would test my faith. My wife got herself pregnant. (laughs) Amen. Take your time, preacher. I will. And we decided to take a road trip. Now, I'm not much of a biology guy, but here's what I know. There's parts of the woman body that expand and there's other parts that shrink. One of those are called the bladder. There wasn't a hotel or a gas station that didn't know our name. By the time we made it to Memphis, Tennessee, which would normally be a six hour drive, but 10 hours later, we made it. But if you put back up that verse, you'll see something about Jesus. The reason why Jesus was standing there Because he understood that everything about the journey is all about the pit stops. In John chapter 4, with the woman at the well, he wasn't running past her. He was sitting there waiting for her. When they brought him the woman caught in adultery, he stood right there. He took time to draw in the sand. For blind Bartimaeus, you notice, he, he literally lays hands and stops for him. And I'm afraid that until we realize the value of standing and stopping, we'll never reproduce ourselves. Busyness has plagued us. It's not so much the dope and the liquor and the cheating and the lying. We're too busy to make disciples because we have somewhere to be. This is how you live when you think this place is your home. Corinthians 5 blows us out the water. You know what it says? That God has prepared a body for us not made by human hands. Stop settling on working so hard for this one. Jesus was so effective because he did what Colossians 3 says. He set his mind on things above. He didn't store up his treasure on earth. And so that's why he was willing to stand. You have to ask yourself, am I going to be willing to stand when people come to me to hear the word of God? And am I going to be still enough to give them a chance to grow in grace and knowledge? Or am I too busy working? Am I too busy hustling? Am I too busy to stop and take the time just to pour into God's people? That's our problem. We don't stand. 
We're not still for nobody. And that's what made Mary choose the greater thing above Martha. Amen? Amen. Martha's, we better quit playing. Amen? We some Martha's. Come on, we give Martha's all a trophy. Martha get bonuses every year. Hallelujah. Shoot. Mary, Mary better get up. Jesus said she chose what was greater because she was willing to stand in the presence of the master. Men, I encourage you with everything in my being today, press in and then stand when God wants to use you. Amen? That's just verse one. We got a lot more to go. People are pressing. Jesus didn't run away from them. He wasn't too busy for them. He stood there as they came by this lake of Gennesaret. Keep the party going. Verse 2. And he saw how many boats? By the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. That means they were headed home, done for the day. This Jesus getting into how many of the boats? Who was the boat for? Everybody say Simon. He had a choice, didn't he? Notice that? The scriptures want us to know there were how many boats? He got into whose boat? Pay attention. The word of God is so rich. Every detail matters. Every detail matters. We'll talk about it in a second. Simon, who was getting ready to go home, he, he asked him, do me a favor, Simon. I need you to put out a little from the land. And then he simply sat down and taught these people who were pressing in on him. Next verse. And when he had finished speaking, he said, now, Simon, I need you to do something. Notice Simon didn't say anything as long as Peter, as long as Jesus was speaking to other people from his boat. Say it one more time. Notice Simon stays quiet. Go back to the previous verse. I don't think they're hearing me. They're full off the stake. He sits in his boat. He teaches other people and doesn't say a word. Now, why is this verse so interesting? Go down. Because now he tells Simon, here's what I need you to do. I need you to leave the surface. I need you to put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Let's see how Simon responds. Simon is the first person to ever talk back to Jesus in the Bible. And if anybody was going to do it, it would be Peter. Pay attention to the exclamation point in case you're a grammatical people. When you see an exclamation point, that means there's nothing calm about it. So let me do my best to show you how Simon whipped up on the Savior. Master, we toiled all night long. Cut the verse off. Thank you. Cut it off. All right. We got a yelling, cussing Simon. We have, that's not funny, young man. Nothing's funny about cussing there. We have a Jesus who has a choice in what boat he wants to go into. And we're talking about discipleship. Why is Simon so upset? Because the Bible tells us he fished all night long. He worked. And oftentimes, guys, we wrap up our identity and our occupations, especially as men. So if fishermen is what you are, and you spend your life catching fish, and as a professional, you fish all night long and don't catch one, you doggone right you're upset. And most of us walk around here angry and upset because the thing we wrap our identities in are no longer working for us. They're not producing the results they're supposed to produce. So even when the Son of God tries to enter your life, you're too upset to recognize him. This marriage, these children, this career, my life, my home, my car, my account, get away from me, Jesus. Yeah. We're angry. You can sit in a conference like this all day long. And be unchanged just like Simon was when Jesus comes into your life. Now, Andrew, why is this so special? Why was Simon so upset? First of all, we don't know if he was ready to go home, what kind of wife he had at home. Simon, what you mean you didn't catch no fish? Y'all don't bring the Bible to real life enough. 
Simon walked through the door. Hey, Simon. Hey, baby. Where's the fish? Well, baby, I ain't catch nothing. Not even a tadpole? Where were you really? Were you at Club Moses? Right? We don't know. We don't know. Yeah, you got a family. Read it. So he's thinking about this stuff, right? Like many of us who sit here tonight, angry as can be, because rather than our identity being found in Christ, it's wrapped in what we do rather than who he is. I say it's wrapped in what we do rather than who he is. So Simon, as angry as he was, <laughs> Jesus looks at him. And this is what I love about God. And please, if you're taking any kind of note, hear this tonight, especially young people. God does not see us the way we see ourselves. Because the truth of the matter is, he had a choice of which boat to get into. Why would you choose the angriest, most disappointed, most upset person that you could possibly find to use their boat to share the gospel? Because God doesn't look at us for who we are. He looks at us for what he can do with us. So Jesus saw this boat, which was the source of Simon's discouragement. It was the very place he sat all night long when he was the most disappointed. And Jesus looked at that same boat and says, that's perfect to be my pulpit. That's the perfect place for me to preach. Just like the first brother who spoke this morning, as he talked about his children, you could see God stepping into the boat of his life and allowing his son's life not to be in vain because it empowered us tonight. How many people thank God he doesn't see us the way you see we see ourselves? So Jesus, stay with me. We're talking real life discipleship. Out of every boat on the river, take Simon's boat. Cussing, complaining, upset Simon, and he preaches to the masses right there. Simon is stuck, ready to go home, getting more angry by the second. Oh, my God, I got to listen to this boring sermon. I don't want this boring stuff. Where were you when I needed to catch a fish? I want to do a fish fry, make a fish come. I'm not trying to hear this. I got bills to pay. Got a wife that's going to be upset. Got kids to take care of. But I'll let this joker use my boat. No, Jesus wasn't finished, though. Stay with us. Because verse 4 says that now, Simon, I need you to do something. How many people know coming to hear the word of God is not the source of what changes your life? Following the word of God is the source of what changes your life. And so now Simon was getting ready to face something. And I think if I get transparent, that was my struggle. You know, came through Hurricane Katrina. I always say I'm grateful that Hurricane Katrina hit my life before she hit New Orleans. Because that's the only way liquor and party and sex before marriage can end is when you choose to let Katrina hit your life. When you choose to follow his word for yourself, otherwise you'll be like I was. Come here, leave out, and do whatever I want to do. But that's not God's will for any of us. And here's what you got to look at in the story. Notice Simon didn't have to get himself together before he came to Jesus. So if you bought into the lie that I'm not ready to make a disciple, my life just isn't right yet. Great, you're the perfect candidate. That's right, that's right. Can I repeat that? If you're lying to yourself, saying, I'm not ready yet. Look at my lifestyle. I'm too angry. If you knew what I just did last night, God said, perfect. Because I don't call a qualify, I qualify those who I'm calling. Amen. I'm your gateway. So perfect. So I hope I just shattered that way of thinking. Because it was in this mess, this rut, this heartache, that now Jesus looks at Pete, Peter and says, look, this is the perfect time for you. This is what I want to use right now. 
And he looks at him and says, now I need you to do something. While everyone else heard my word on the shore and went home, I need you to come experience something in the deep. Now, here's why this was such a rough request. Because back in the day, you read the text, they used nets. So fishermen typically didn't fish where they could not see. They only fished where they could see. Are y'all hearing this? So this unconventional request, Peter looks at Jesus and says, dude, preach your sermon. I'm an expert at fishing. We don't fish like this. Anybody ever told God you don't know what you're talking about? You're not in my shoes. You are a carpenter. God says, I created it all. All things were created by me and for me and in me all things hold together. Why won't you trust me with that but you trust me with this? Why am I just your Sunday morning men conference God? Why am I not your everyday praying? It's what Simon says, you don't know what you're talking about. Jesus said, Peter, I need you for the first time in your life to stop fishing in places you can see. Stop going back to the same old people in the same old section and coming out living the same old life. For the first time in your life, I need you to do something you've never done before. I need you to go into the deep. God called him to fish where he couldn't see. That's the God we serve. He doesn't want us to settle for the surface stuff. The stuff we leave the same way we came. The stuff that doesn't produce any life change. The stuff that keeps you going down the same alley, in the same street, in the same way, and there's nothing about it that's real. You don't know why people sing. You don't know why people come. It's because you've been on the surface too long. The glory is only in the deep. If I could sing, I would say, roll, roll, roll your boat, right? Come into the deep. Because that's the only place Jesus lives. And so you know what happened next. Simon got real disrespectful. Jesus, you don't know what we're talking about. We've always done it like this. Show my picture of my favorite sea creature. It's one of my favorite sea creatures in all the world. Oh, I love that thing right there. Woo, I love them. Oyster. Why do you love oysters so much? I do love to eat them. I'm from New Orleans. I will say that. Fried, doesn't matter, Rockefeller, but that's not what I'm talking about. When I grew up, I was once taught that if a grain of sand, stay with me, enters an oyster shell, boop, it produces a pearl. And then I got older and learned how to read, and I found out that story is only partly true. In order for an oyster to produce a pearl, it can't do so on the surface. Oysters only produce pearls at the bottom of the sea in the deep. In order for it to actually have a way to produce a pearl, something must lodge itself into its shell, known as an intruder. It could be a piece of metal, a piece of fish bone, or a piece of sand, and it's known as an irritant. Why? Because it will be the equivalent of a piece of metal or sand at the back of your gums, constantly gnawing at it, which will make you want to spit it out. But what I love about the oyster is it takes its worst pain, wraps something called nuclei around it over and over and over again, and it creates its most prized possession, a pearl. You know my favorite part about it is oysters don't wear pearls. That one's free. You'll get it when you get home. And for some of us who took the slow bus like I did, Ultimately, what it went through and the pain it experienced had everything to do with someone around the world wearing its testimony around its neck. How many people know that your story, your pain, Jesus wants to enter your boat to produce something in someone's life that wouldn't have gotten it any other way? And that's why you're just right for Jesus. So again, I stayed here so long, men, 
because we're in an identity crisis right now. That most of us are walking time bombs, never wanting to endure anything. We're professional quitters. That's why there's so many broken relationships today. And God is saying, what if the same way I let Simon experience pain was so that I could enter his boat and reveal my glory could be the exact same way he could enter your boat and take your greatest pain and make his most prized possession. Your pearl, his glory. Amen. Amen. Now, here's what I love about Simon in verse four. Go to that verse. Master, we toiled all night long and took nothing. Here's what I love about Simon, and write this down. Simon had every reason to quit, had every reason not to go on, but for my grammatical sound people, Simon chose not to put a period where Jesus put a comma. Your story isn't finished yet. Most of us end our stories with God right there. I tried it your way, God, and ain't nothing changing. No, something's changing. You're not just getting what you want the way you want it. David said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. We quote quote it like we agree with it. Oh, y'all didn't catch that one. Yeah, Psalm 23, y'all know that one. Shout amen. amen. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Well, why you want so much? Simon's issue. He chose not to stop there. And I believe that there's some people today God is adding to your story. That he's saying it's not a period, it's only a comma. I once heard if you're going through hell, keep going. Just keep going. The old folks used to say trouble don't last always. Because he made this next statement. He said, I have every reason to quit. I didn't catch nothing. I can't feed my family. Ain't no money in the account. I failed so many times. I should give up on myself. And then he tells us to say this next word. If I only have one reason to keep going, if I only have one reason not to give up, if there's only one statement I can make in this message, I only have one statement in this world that matters most. And it's simply three words. At your word. I may not have any other reason to go on. I may have every reason to quit, but if your word was strong enough to make this world, if your word was strong enough to make the sun and the moon and the stars go up all day and all night, then obviously your word is powerful enough to sustain me through this. At your word. Oh, yeah. At your word. It may not make sense. I have no reason to trust you right now. My needs aren't being met. I'm not getting what I want, but God, it was you who was there for me when nobody else was there to listen. It was you that loved me when I didn't know how to love myself. Your word says your grace and mercy will follow me all the days of your life. And then it says, because your love is better than life, my lips will give you glory. So, God, I may not want to go on, but I'm going to take this journey at your word. I will let down the nets, not on the surface this time, but on the deep. Everybody on the shore is laughing at me like I've lost my mind because we don't fish here. (laughs) Do you know how dumb this dude looked? I don't even use the word dumb, but this was a dumb-looking person. No one else does this, but God is calling you to do the unthinkable. That's God. Ain't nothing normal about him. You are an alien and stranger and foreigner to this world. I'm sorry, you are E.T. here. Not your home anymore. So yeah, you're going to love when people spew hate at you. Yeah, you're going to have joy when you should experience sorrows. Why? Because we learn obedience through what we suffer. That's the Bible. That's why he suffered. But he says if we suffer with him, we will reign with him. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to let go of my bondage. I've lived as a slave to other people's thoughts for too long. That's what's hurting us. What people think about us have become sovereign over our lives. 
That's why we do what we do. I don't care how, it's all ages. There's peer pressure at every age. But this time, I'm going to perform for an audience of one. He lets down the nets. What happens in the next verse? Now, I'm going to get y'all to fill in the blanks. This is going to blow your mind. If this is your first time seeing this, say amen when we finish. This is what discipleship looks like. And when, fill in the blank, everybody read with this one. Had done this, next word, it closed a large number of fish and nets were breaking. Next verse. Signal to their, in the other boat to come and help and came and filled. My man's getting it. Filled both the boats so that began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Keep going. For he and who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that had taken. Last two verses. And also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. Last verse. And when had brought boats to the land, left everything in. If this is your first time seeing that, say amen. All right. What's the big word that came up over and over again? Say it. Come on, y'all. We're almost done. Let that state come out of you. They. Y'all, this is why you can't put a period where God put a comma. This is why most people think this chapter is about Jesus calling Peter to follow him. While Peter is a part of it, you understand that Jesus took Peter's I and turned it into a they? I thought this was just about Simon, Peter, and Jesus. The same people who watched Simon quit. Stay there. The same people who watched Simon make the same mistakes time and time and time again were the same people who saw a sovereign God enter his boat at the very darkest time of his life. Because while everybody else may have given up on Simon, Jesus didn't. Jesus enters this boat. Simon, with his last ounce of faith, says, I don't see any reason to give this a shot. I've wrecked my life. But if you're still willing to get in the boat with me after all that I've done, the least I can do is go out at your word. He goes out. His eye turns to they. Start, start back at verse 6 again. All right. Seven. I thought that was five. All right, there's six. There we go. Nets are breaking. Keep the party going. They signaled partners. Other boats come. Boat boats begin to do what? Next verse. All right. Here's the thing that's amazing. Can I just be honest? If, if I'm in a boat, this is what I mean we read the Bible real fast. And I'm in a boat that's sinking. And I'm about to die. All I want to do is get to shore. I'm not trying to be out here signaling nobody. I'm just trying to get back to a place where I can live. But then something weird happens. Rather than saying, get me to shore like I would have done, I'm just being honest. Jesus, I get it. Okay, you're the man. Simon does what some of us in this room has never done before. Fish are jumping. Filling up the entire boat, right? I'll get up here. 
fish is all over his body and his face. And he locks on to Jesus' knees. And he does the one thing, which is the first step to discipleship. He confesses his sin. Do you not realize that before he nearly died, that Jesus could have asked him to follow him 20 minutes ago? But notice that you can't be a disciple until you take the first step of saying, Lord, I'm a sinful man. And if your pride has choked you and robbed you of an opportunity to know your God, then tonight can be your night. Because what did it really take for Simon to stop everything he did in order to fall on his knees? Here's what he realized, that this story was never about fish entering a boat. Simon realized that he was the empty boat that needed to be filled. And everything we go through in God, And everything God takes us through is so we get to the same place Simon got to and say, God, I've tried everything in this life to fill me. But your word says you place eternity into the heart of man. So the only way we can ever be filled is to fall at the knees of Jesus. So why would it be a call to this altar tonight? So God can fill your boat. Sin has to be dealt with, and then he's then going to tell you to follow me. Amen. Next step after he deals with his sin, they get back to shore. That's right. Next verse. All of them were astonished. They were stupefied. They were shocked. They were in amazement. Can you believe that this whole story takes place From one dude who was rejecting God to then saying, I'm going to obey your word through my brokenness, through my hurt and my pain. And now you have dozens of men saying, here I am, God. One broken man gave God a chance. I said one broken man gave God a chance. We all come broken. Nobody has a patent on the Holy Spirit. He fills crack pots. Come on, keep the party going. James is there. John is there. Jesus said to Simon, look, don't be afraid. Because all this was about is you catching other men. You spent your life doing everything you wanted to do, going where you wanted to go, watching what you wanted to watch, and you lived your whole life empty and broken. Now that I filled you, I need you to catch somebody else. Next verse. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed me. It's what my brother said, Frank. Come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. This will be a big note for you to take down. To follow Jesus is to fish for Jesus. If you're not fishing, you're not following. Notice he didn't wait till day two or day three. He told him from day one, if you choose to follow me, here's what that means. You're going to do for others what I've done for you. Hallelujah. All right. No, that ain't the shout moment, but I want to shout because we've rejected the true God. And it's hard to hear that truth. We've served a Jesus made in our own image. The Jesus of the Bible says, look, if you leave this boat, if you were to just say, come follow me, period, all of us would be 100 percenters in the room. Unfortunately, the sentence didn't stop there. He said, if you come and follow me, here's the contract. You will be made into a fisher of men, period. Period. And so on tonight, that's what that call is. So we play some music in the background. Not in any shape or form or way, and we don't even need much music. Because I believe there's two calls tonight to all the men here. But final story I want to tell, and we'll end it. Give me my first picture, if you don't mind. A story I love so dearly. 
takes place about 500 years ago. And the story is told about a servant. I hope I'm strong enough for this. I may not be. Oh, this. All right. This servant had one job. So I'm going out my way for this illustration. His one job, ooh wee, was simple. His job was to go down two miles to the river, fill up both of his buckets, and bring them back to the master's house. Simple job. For two years, his job was simple. Go down to the river, fill both buckets, bring them back to his master's house. That was it. Now, two years into this, next picture, the buckets begin to have a conversation. The one with the smile on his face said, I'm happy I'm not like the other bucket. I never waste a drop of water. I'm strong, I'm bold, and I'm beautiful, and I'm not cracked up like that other pot. He's trash, he's worthless, he's meaningless. Look at him, he can't even keep any water down. He's a weak bucket. He's a waste of time. The other bucket that you see with the crack in his side, he was discouraged. He looked at the servant, he said, listen, why do you even put up with someone like me? Every time you come down to this water, you, you carry me back to the master's house. And by the time we make it back to the master's house, I continue to spill more than half the water. I'm a waste of time. Just because of this crack on my side, I'm broken because of what I've been through. You shouldn't put up with someone like me. And the servant smiled. He just laughed. And he looked at him and he said, he said, take a walk with me. And he picked him up. He said, Look at the other pot side and look at your side. See, the other pot side is, is dry because he's so full of himself. He said, I knew that I made you with that crack in your side, so before we started this journey, I planted seeds on your side of the path. And because of your cracks, our entire village is experiencing all the flowers, all the fruit, all the glory, all the purpose has come through your cracks. So don't be discouraged another day. Don't be dismayed another moment. Because your cracks display my glory. So show your cracks. Say, come with me into the master's house. You see his daughter getting ready for prime? That's all because of your cracks. Your scars have become your stars. Those are the places I shine brightest. But it all starts when you pray to me and confess. And that you set aside your agenda and make a decision for the first time and say, God, I followed you, but I've never fished for you. So I've never really experienced the joy of walking with you. And you brought me here to a men's conference tonight and allowed a young man to become homeless and lose a four-bedroom home and two cars and one day in Katrina just to tell you that all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. 